Okay. I think we're all set. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to everyone here in Elgin and everyone that is viewing this program online. The program today is on the topic of fake news, and it is co-sponsored by the Illinois Library Association, reaching across the Illinois library system, AKA Rails, mm -hmm. and the Illinois Library Association's advocacy program, or committee, excuse me. My name is Bob Doyle. I'm the executive director of the Illinois Library Association. I believe my role here today is to be the moderator, um, and that's to offer a bit of context, introduce our panelists, and then finally preside over a Q&A session where you all will have the opportunity, both here in Elgin and also online, to uh, participate. I think uh, I've been also assigned some housekeeping responsibilities also. So the context. I'm not quite sure when I first heard the term fake news, but I certainly have never heard it as often as I have had heard it in the last few months. There have been hoaxes and planted stories in the media pretty much since the media has come into existence. And depending upon your interpretation of the term fake news, myth and legends could fall under the heading also. Now you may be responding by saying what distinguishes today's fake news from earlier examples is the intent. Is there an intent to deceive to bring about a specific consequence? My answer is yes, but even in those earlier examples, those were aimed at a desired response, such as a conversion to a belief system or placating an enemy. And whether or not the originator or the ones who pass along the story believe the fake news is true is not the only determinant. Fake news has rapidly become a catch-all term to discredit all types of stories, most often the ones, well, that we disagree with. <laughs> Fake news reports soar on social media where links are given the same weight regardless of the source, particularly on Facebook where there is an enormous potential audience and the implied endorsement of the friend who publishes or shares the information. The term has become widely used, maybe perhaps too widely used, and covers a multitude of sins. But for our purposes here today, it's not necessarily to broaden or limit the definition of the term, but to explore a way that libraries can address this phenomenon. A recent study by Stanford's uh, Graduate School of Education examined more than 7,800 responses from middle school, high school, and college students in 12 US states about those students' ability to assess information sources. The researchers were shocked by the students' quote, stunning and dis dismaying consistency and that is the consistency to be unable to evaluate information even at a basic level of this is an ad versus this is a story. Students were unable to make those distinctions. Now it's not because the students or the readers are stupid or even that they're credulous. It's because in my opinion that the news format is easy to copy and true stories these days sometimes are outlandish enough to make them believable. In the purest form, fake news is completely made up, manipulated to resemble credible journalism and attract maximum attention and with it, advertising revenue. A few examples cited by The Guardian in the recent article on the subject are the following. Uh, these are the <clears throat> titles or the headlines. Transgender tampon now on the market. Pope Francis at White House says Koran and Holy Bible are the same. And U2's Bono is rescued during a terror attack, issues sick message to victims. 
Strictly speaking, fake news is completely made up and designed to deceive readers to maximize traffic and profit. But the definition is often expanded to include websites that circulate distorted, decontextualized, or dubious information through tactics that include clicking on headlines that don't reflect the facts of the story or undeclared bias. With nearly all online media motivated by some extent by views, the temptation to get people to click no matter why or on what can be hard to resist. Clearly sites you've never heard of may be more suspect than mainstream media, but no one is blameless, not even us. When misleading information, excuse me, when, while misleading to harvest clicks is a concern, there could be a more corrosive uh, effort underway. An individual fake story creates a false sense of, on a particular issue. But repeated false attacks on traditional, reliable sources of news undermines one of the major pillars of a free society. If no source can be believed, then all sources are treated equally or to be believed equally. Pretty much everyone is an influencer within his or her own social network. Librarians probably even more so than most. It's our job not only to make sure that the sources that we share are responsible, but we also, our job is to help others to develop the tools and the techniques to make their own judgment. In many presentations, I cite very impressive statistics about how libraries remain more popular than almost anything. And this is not fake news. They're <laughs> even more popular than apple pie, that is, libraries are. I think our panel will have some key insight into if and when and how libraries could use this immense and an unrivaled popularity to affect the issues of fake news and the undermining of traditional authoritative sources. And that's what our panelists are here to do today, to help you navigate the explosion, explosion of information that appears daily and separate the true from fake, the real from the made up, the fact from alternative fact, the reliable from suspect. Our panelists are Jim Davis from the Daily Herald to discuss how newspaper stories are vetted for accuracy before print, how newspapers continue to work to be trusted sources, and how they are responding to current pressures. Katie Hauser from the school district U46 right here in Elgin, the high school, will explain how librarians help students to evaluate websites and resources available to help in the evaluation process. Veranda Pitchford is one of our co is from one of our co-sponsoring organizations, namely Rails, and she will discuss the role of libraries, librarians, excuse me, in the digital age to support the development of an informed society with essential critical thinking skills to contribute to a civic engaged society. And then finally, Margaret Peebles here from our host library, the Gail Borden Public Library District, will discuss how to evaluate uh, resources and how to combat fake news. I had planned to say, so we're gonna immediately begin with Jim, but I was told to just go over a couple of housekeeping details before we kind of turn this over to the panelists. Uh, since this program is being streamed, um, we are asking everyone to save their questions until the end. For the audience here that is in, um, in Elgin, the in-person audience, there are, are cards for your questions at the end of the row, or people will show you where those cards are. Raise your hand, we'll collect them at the end. And then for those uh, people that are on a YouTube channel, channel, the questions can be submitted via YouTube. For people without YouTube channels but still would like to submit a question, 
Those questions can be emailed to uh, Denise Raleigh here at the Gail Borden Public Library. And that email address is the first initial of her name, D for Denise, Raleigh, her last name, R-A-L-E-I-G-H at Gail Borden, as if that's one word, dot info. So with those housekeeping details uh, done, I think we can safely turn the, uh, begin the program of, to the panelists with uh, Jim making his comments. Thank you, Bob. Uh, can everybody hear okay? No, okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> the commercial. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge Elena Ferrar and Elena Ferrar, folks out there, uh, who got out of sick bay today to come and attend this session. Um, and I'm really glad to see her because when we were discussing what we were going to be doing uh, today for news, putting the newspaper this afternoon online and in tomorrow's print editions, uh, one of our, our Fox Valley editor mentioned there was a fake news seminar at Gail Borden Library, and he wasn't sure if Elena was going to be there to, to cover it because she's been sick for a while. And uh, some wise guy in the meeting popped up, well, Jim, you're on the panel. You can cover the meeting, too. <laughs> and I said, no problem at all. I'll make something up. <laughs> Obviously, we don't make stuff up at the Daily Herald. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have pretty good, pretty basic set of safeguards in, in place to make sure that our stories are, are, not, are not fabricated. I, I don't know that we've ever been accused of doing a story that our staff produced that somebody said was completely made up. Have they been criticized for tone, inflection, intent? You bet. And that didn't just start last week. That started... That was, that was an issue when I started the paper 38 years ago. So in some ways, none of this has changed. Uh, but what, what has changed is we're under more scrutiny and more pressure and more accusations of bias and prejudice and promoting an agenda than I have ever seen, not, not even close. Uh, and, and I'll get into that a little bit more later. But uh, what I wanted to do first is talk about what we do to make sure that our stories, as Bob mentioned, are vetted for accuracy. Um, I would say maybe the main component of that is very careful and painstaking uh, attribution. If you look at a Daily Herald news story, you'll see almost in every paragraph there will be some kind of attribution, usually at the end, saying who said what, particularly in a, in a direct quote, but just any information that's there, you will see, here's who said it. Uh, in fact, I, I've been of a mind that sometimes our, our, maybe crusade is a strong word, but, but our efforts to be meticulous in our attribution sometimes is a little bit in, in conflict with good writing. But we are on the side of caution and I would say you could pick out just about any story that, let's say, Elena did that's in today's paper, and you will see that you know where all the information came from. We ask people, when we're talking to them, to talk on the record, to, to know that, that what they say is going to be used in, in the newspaper. And when we do that, we say, this is what so-and-so had to say about this issue. Um, on the rare occasion that... Uh, it's a sensitive topic. It's something that we can't easily get people to talk about. We'll use anonymous sources. It's not something that just Elena, again, decides to do out of the blue. She has to come to me, and I have to go to either the editor or the managing editor and get their okay to use anonymous sources. I have to tell them who the source is and why this is the only way we can get this information in the paper and why it's important. Um, the other thing that I think um, helps make sure our stories are accurate, the editing process is, is pretty, uh, I wouldn't say complex, but comprehensive. Uh, in the case of just about every story we do, there is what we call a content or a line editor who will look the story over closely, 
for fairness, for accuracy, for balance, for proper attribution. Uh, and if there's something that we think is, is lacking, we'll ask the reporter about it. We'll send the story back to the reporter with a note saying, hey, you need to do this, that, and the other thing, or we'll talk to them about it. In other words, just make sure it's a story that we're, we're comfortable with when we send it to our copy desk, where it will get, on most occasions, at least two more edits. Uh, again, maybe not so much for content as for style, adherence to style, and spelling, and grammar, and that sort of thing. And they will put the final headline on the story. So, again, it's, it's a process that involves a number of people. Far less likely, I would say, that something that's wildly inaccurate or worse yet, fake, is going to get into the paper. Um, the other thing that I think we have going for us at, at the Herald is we have a lot of institutional knowledge. Most of our editors, our line editors, have been with the paper for at least 20 years, and in many cases more than that. There, there are people who've been at the paper as long as I have, even a little bit longer. Um, we know a lot about the suburbs now, and we can, we can sometimes spot some things that just aren't completely accurate. So. Uh, I think all those things come together to make sure that our stories are as accurate as, as they possibly can be. Do we get it wrong sometimes? Sure. And we run corrections when we do. But again, I, I can't recall us ever uh, being accused or having to deal with a story that was an out-and-out -out fabrication. That said, I, I think a much bigger challenge for us now is the perception of how the media is seen these days. Again, we've always been accused of having political leanings for whatever reason. We're, and frankly, in a fairly conservative spot like the, like the suburbs, we're probably more often than not accused of being too liberal. But on the same day, I know our managing editor got a couple of cancellation notices. One said we were too liberal. The other one said we were too conservative. So <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of a, of a, of a can't-win situation, but again, that's nothing terribly new, but I think what is new is how widely stories get passed around and how many different sources of information. I'm, I'm using that word carefully. I don't want to say news because I want to say information because some of what is online, as Bob mentioned, is not really news called through the normal uh, methods that, that good journalists employ. So people come kind of forearmed to a story of ours, or the New York Times, or the Washington Post, and they can uh, pretty much have their minds made up about what, what is what, and then when they see something that runs contrary to that, uh, they can uh, try to call us out on it, they can, they can do online commenting, that's, that's a relatively new phenomena, and uh, they can write letters to the editor, and I have a couple examples maybe I'll share with you later uh, that, that show the wide perception, wide range of perceptions that we have. But um, I will tell you this, when uh, the, the President of the United States can call CNN and the New York Times fake news, we clearly have a perception problem. And uh, yeah, we, we, we can fight back and say that's that's an extreme view that's that's clearly a guy with a with a bias with a bone to pick with the media but really I think what we need to do is get better at what we do and I know what we spend a lot of time doing these days is being very careful about word choice about headlines about what they may not just mean but connote um, headlines are hugely important and I'll give you two examples of that um, we have a uh, cops and crime column that uh, runs every week. And a few weeks ago, we did a story that talked about crime statistics that the FBI put out for a half year. And we were looking at some of the bigger towns that are in our coverage area, and one of them is Elgin. And those crime statistics were not particularly flattering to Elgin. And we noted that in the column, and the headline said something to the effect of Elgin's crimes are 
30 percent that higher in the same period than that of the uh, city of Chicago. Um, it was not inaccurate. It was it was true, but city council and the mayor in particular were not too happy, particularly with that headline, and they called us out in a very public way at the last city council meeting. And uh, frankly, in my opinion, maybe took it a little farther than they needed to. Said that our story was inaccurate. It was not. Yes, there was a matter of perception. In fact, we took the step of changing the online headline a bit to tone down the comparison with the city of Chicago, which I can see where the city council would not be too fond of. But, but the dialogue just got a little bit extreme there, and now we're, we're in negotiations with the city to uh, talk about some of our differences and perceptions, and we'll keep you posted on that. By the way, I would point out that Elena, as the Elgin reporter, a few days later, did a story on the whole year's worth of statistics from the uh, Elgin PD, and uh, of course they were happy with that because it didn't have that same headline on it, but it did tell the bigger picture, and I do think that's one thing that we need to do. You know, we're not a run-and-gun outfit. We don't come in and just do the most sensational stories in a town. Yes, they come up from time to time, but we also write again and again and again, and I would argue that we do far more positive stories about the communities we cover than ones that would be described as a hit piece. Um, headlines. Headlines are a really big deal. And let me just give you a quick example, and I, as I see we need to move on here. Um, we wrote a headline when uh, President Trump uh, called out John Lewis, the uh, congressman who had questioned the legitimacy of his presidency. And uh, the headline that we ran was, Trump attacks black leader. Uh, it was an active voice headline, but we took a lot of flack for that headline. Uh, some people, copy desk tells me, actually thought that we meant physically attacks oh. this black leader, as if we thought he hit him in the mouth or something. Um, obviously, that wasn't the case. It's an action verb, attacks. Uh, you could argue it's, it was too strong, it misexplained the thing, or you could argue it was fine. Maybe we could have used the word threaten. But <laughs> here's another com complexity of the business. Threaten is a longer word, and that story happened to run in a one-column hole on the front page. Mm -hmm. Threaten is, sometimes just doesn't fit. So, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to excuse away possible errors in judgment, but I, I am trying to point out that it's, it's a pretty complex process. And, but again, I think our real mission these days is to make sure what we do is justifiable and defensible. Thank you. Thank you. Again, hi, my name is Katie Hauser. I'm the Elgin High School librarian, and this is my fourth year in a, working in Elgin. I'd like to talk a little bit about evaluating websites and what we do and what have been doing for years to help students um, learn how to do accurate and responsible research at school. Um, I would like to note that the Stanford University study that came out last year gave us a lot of information that we kind of already knew. Our students are having a lot of trouble um, differentiating the information that the, between ads and um, content on websites. They're very quick in their actions and they're very quick in what they want to find. Um, I don't know if you know any teenagers, but they like, to, they like information and they like it fast. So we are trying to combat that with a variety of um, lessons and conversations that we're having in the school district. Um, I, I, just some interesting information that I have from my students. I, I polled 196 students from Elgin High School, and 86% of them are getting their news from online social media, which is consistent with what we're finding outside of schools as well. And 56% of them were getting it from TV. Now, I don't know if that's really true, if they're sitting down and watching the news, but I do know that they're on their phones all the time. So I do believe that Facebook and um, Snapchat and Twitter are the ways that they're getting their news. So if we want to reach these students and we want to teach them how to get at the articles that they want to find, we're going to have to talk about the social media that they're using. Um, I teach evaluating websites with a variety of classes. 
I've, right now, I'm in the middle. I have to go back after this and teach a, evaluating websites to a biology class. Um, we're also, we also work with English classes and social studies classes. And my favorite activity that I found that I use is to have the students sit in small groups. And they can compare two different websites. So I show them two sites. And they have to decide which one is the most reliable based on those two sites. I'm doing this with biology, like I said, right now. And the two sites that they're comparing about are, are about dihydrogen monoxide, which if you don't make that connection right away, that's H2O. That's water. It's a hoax site that's been out for years. I've been using it for about three years. So it's fake news is not a new thing. Um, and I think that the fake news that the kids are dealing with right now is just more prevalent because we're talking about it more. Um, when given the comparison between a dihydrogen monoxide <laughs> pay to support the removal of dihydrogen monoxide site and an NBC News article from 2004, they can't figure out which one to pick. Because the dihydrogen monoxide site has a date counter at the bottom that changes the date every single day to be updated. So they're like, oh, great, this one's the most recent because it was updated. So we have a whole conversation about when this um, was updated and how you can tell if there's a date counter at the bottom of the page and what that little PayPal sign at the top means. <laughs> and like, even though there's a lot of text on the page, it doesn't mean that it's worthy of your time. So that's a really great um, resource or lesson that I've been working on with kids for a few years. And after we go through the presentation part of the story, I always have the kids practice. Because as soon as they walk away from me, I'm pretty sure they forget every single thing that I've said. <laughs> so we have to have some practice time to be able to like sit down with a half sheet of paper and go through those criteria for evaluating websites. I try to keep it simple. I try to keep it um, on their terms. So we talk about purpose. We talk about authority. We talk about bias. And we talk about date. That's just the most basic evaluating websites lesson that I give. Once they've practiced, I engage with them in a conversation. Because I believe that if you have a conversation with a student about the websites that they're looking at, they're more likely to have a memory <laughs> of having that conversation. And the next time they're sitting at the computer having to turn in a research paper in five minutes, they might be able to come up with an article that is a little more reliable, hopefully, hopefully. So, and this is not a conversation that can be had in once. This is a conversation that we need to continue to have all four years. And I'm not the only person who teaches evaluating <coughs> websites and fake news. I know that there are teachers in my school who are doing the same thing. It has to come from home. It has to come from the public library. It has to come from the school library. We all have to kind of band together to get this critical thinking stuck in people's heads because I don't think it's quite there yet. And as I move forward in my teaching and I continue to reflect and um, decide how I'm going to improve my teaching lessons, I think I'll incorporate a few more social media outlets just because of that large response of um, them using Facebook for news outlets. I think that that is a really important thing for me to add to my comparison of um, news articles or websites. So a big question right now is when should we tar start teaching about me media literacy? And when, this, when I told this yeah. group, everyone started laughing because I say we start in preschool. <laughs> but um, School Library Journal says the same thing. We need to start to <laughs> I am not the only one. verified your source. I verified my source. <laughs> <laughs> um, School Library Journal says that we need to talk to these students as they so that they can acquire skills before they get on the social media. They need to be able to acquire skills that they are going to use as they continue to become digital learners. Um, we have a new information and digital literacy curriculum that was just passed by the board um, in our district. And it allows for preschool and kindergarten students to begin working on digital and media literacy from the beginning of their classroom time. Students are required to identify the author and title of works. So it may be a book or it may be a website. 
Students are also required to begin navigating a website and learning how to use the mouse and the keyboard, which that you think they would know that already, but we need them to be quality typists. We need them to be able to move around and identify parts of a website to be able to be um, critical thinkers of information. You know, we kind of need librarians as well. <laughs> the arts librarians are working really hard to combat this information. And certified school librarians um, can really help teachers out who are overwhelmed and not able to keep adding more information to their curriculum. So school librarians can be co-teachers and advocates for the teachers and the students who need this information. I have a few resources that are available that I used. And one of the really awesome, most awesome resources that I found was a pathfinder that a librarian created at Zion Benton Township High School. OK, that's a really big mouthful. Zion Benton Township High School. She created a lib guide where there's videos and articles and fake news articles that you can use. Um, it's, uh, it's, and she said I was able to mention it here. And it was really a great start for me to start learning more about fake news and social media. I've also used News Literacy Project, Common Sense Media. There are a couple of TED Talks that are really great out there that you can use for talking about fake news with your students. And my teachers suggested using Apple News and Google News because they aggregate the information and aggregate the articles in one place so that the students can differentiate between the different points of view that are being um, published. My favorite of all, OK, I guess I have two favorites, because the Zion Benton Township <laughs> was really great. But the other one was allsides.com. This was introduced to me mm -hmm. by a social studies teacher. Allsides.com will give you um, a topic and then three different articles on the same topic, a left side, a right side, and a center side for that topic. So that's a really great way to give students the perspective that they need when they're um, researching for their top, for their projects at school. And that's all I have. <laughs> you cannot ask a librarian to pick their favorite resource. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, one more thing. One more thing. Uh, my name is Veronda Pitchfork. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I'm with the Reaching Across Illinois Library System. I'm the director of membership there. Our job, our key role, is to make all types of libraries an essential part of their community. Informally, I like to say we make libraries, we want libraries to be the rock stars of their community. Mm -hmm. In a land very far away, a long time ago, it was called the 90s, I was an <laughs> academic librarian at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And in fact, it's how I started my library career. During that time, uh, when that was when uh, people were just, in my experience, starting to integrate uh, internet resources into their academic research, students were starting to do that. With a wonderful colleague of mine, uh, and I shuddered when I looked at the curriculum for this talk, I co-taught a class called The Politics of Information Access uh, in about 96 or 97 at that time, which is like a relic at this point. Anyway, um, my, during my time at UIC, which was my first library gig and uh, my first professional job, I had an experience that uh, I want to share with you that shaped my view of librarianship and demonstrated to me early in my career how important the librarian is in the role of people accessing quality content. I was, I was a reference librarian, and a student came to me at the desk a very young student. Sometimes we helped high school students. It's a very open school. Sometimes we helped college students. And she was like one of my first days on the desk. And she asked me, um, I need to do a paper on how Martin Luther King influenced the civil rights movement. And I looked up at the sky and I said, thank you. This is the best question in my life. I am ready. I started railing her with Gandhi resources. How, let's compare to other political resistance movements around the world. And she looked at me and she said, I don't know what the word influence means. So sure, she could have put that in a Google search. Heck, she could have found a whole paper. 
and just turn that in. But what she needed was someone to model for her what you do when you don't know what a word means, so you know what to do the next time you know what a word, so you can do it right the next time. So it was a really important experience for me, and I connect it to what we're doing here now, because at that time, people weren't digital natives. And at that time, we, at least when I taught that class, we didn't understand that technology, and specifically the internet, is a tool. And it's a vehicle to deliver all types of things, as we all know. It gives us cute cat videos. <laughs> it gives us hard-cutting news. It gives me celebrity gossip. So, you know, it goes from the ridiculous to the sublime as to what it's delivering. But for a lot of us, especially those of us who were, have had it from the cradle, technology has been conflated with the resource. And for me, it demonstrates with uh, that conflating how critical our role is as librarians to support kids, as Katie is doing, adults with seeing so many things coming from so many different ways, how people can use the, this tool to get at quality content. I'll, I'll say it that way, be it for, and I know we're here to talk about fake news, be it for, uh, you know, factual fact checking or for leisure learning, because obviously we have a big role in that. Um, as Katie said, uh, we are the people who can do it. Uh, and as Bob mentioned, not only are libraries more popular than apple pie, which I didn't know, <laughs> we are uh, one of the most trusted uh, parts of local government in terms of who we are, what we do, and how we serve the community. Uh, the, the thing is, I mentioned uh, before, as Bob mentioned, I believe for academic, which we, my organization serves academic, special, school, and public libraries in northern and western Illinois in that region. And I believe in all those cases, we are working to support people in connecting with quality content and using that modeling of learning and for anybody to get at it. Uh, as and all of our role is more so in a public and an academic setting is to uh, create that informed, engaged society to participate in civic engagement and discourse around a topic. I think a big part of that today is as uh, Katie and Margaret work, because uh, I'm a little further than that, my, they are my uh, patrons now as a director of membership, is to um, shift to support people as Katie helps them look at facts and verify facts, is to, because it is so critical now more than ever for us to have these conversations across issues, is to shift that discourse to focus on fact and not emotion. And I say that for myself. As God is my witness, I'll be on Facebook and I want to hit that share button. I'm like, check it out first. <laughs> Just check it out. Because the karma that comes on a librarian who shares fake news. <laughs> You're going to write about that later, Elena. <laughs> so really, because, I mean, and of course, uh, we're human. All of us are triggered by emotion. But as we uh, revisit and exercise our critical thinking muscles by verifying facts and checking other sources to ensure we're sharing accurate information, it's uh, really important to, to keep people doing that and to keep that muscle going as we, so we can kind of create and main this discourse and uh, create more civic engagement. Uh, lastly, I just want to say, you know, libraries are places for learning and discovery, and um, librarians are the most uh, able and trained guides to connect people to these resources to really participate and contri contribute in this kind of discourse. So I'm all set. Yeah. See? Thanks, Veranda. Because I you gave just, you some minutes. Yeah, you just made me feel really good, though. I'm a librarian. Oh, no, it's true. Oh, you know, I believe that. every second of it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Ask anyone. I believe you. 
It's not fake news. It's not fake news. My name is Margaret Peebles, and I work here at the Gail Borden Public Library and Public Services. And have you guys heard how Tom Hanks was filming in New Zealand, and he was taking a break, walking around, and he was distracted, and he fell off a 30-foot cliff? <laughs> That's Forrest Gump, you guys. <laughs> And that's one fake news story that I did fall for completely. And yes, someone did come into the library to tell me that story, that that had happened. The public library serves all ages. We have a very unique and important role to fill in this age of fake news, alternative facts, and post-truth. A recent survey by the Maine State Library stated that librarians are the second most trusted professionals out of 22 professions. Do you want to know what the first one was? Who yeah. cares? Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> well, we should know so we could knock them out. <laughs> <laughs> the first one was, was nurses. Oh, well, oh okay. <laughs> That's okay, then. <laughs> Well-deserved. Well-deserved, okay. right. But we do feel this trust every day here at the Gail Borden Library when our customers come to our desks and ask for assistance with research, tech help, or just to have a conversation. A January 2017 article in Public Libraries Magazine really nailed this fake news issue on the head for me. It says that fake news is not just an election issue. It is an information and media literacy issue. And who better to help the public navigate information and evaluate media sources than our librarians? Our librarians feel it's their role to guide all of our users to accurate sources, which makes the public library a great weapon in the fight against fake news. Where else do users go to ask for help with their reference questions or ask a second opinion on an email they receive that may look a little fishy, or even just come in and have a conversation about how Tom Hanks fell off a cliff. <laughs> All of these are opportunities for our librarians to teach about credible sources, database use, evaluating websites, and general critical thinking skills. It reminds me of a transaction that took place many years ago when I was a children's librarian at another library. And this was close to probably over 20 years ago now, so it just shows how long librarians have been fighting against alternative facts. But this young, young gentleman, this young student, came up to the reference desk. He had to do a research paper on bioluminescent animals. Now, bioluminescent animals are like like fireflies. They have their own biochemical way to create and emit their own light. And this young man was so proud. He thought he was so ahead of the curve because he'd already chosen his animal. He came up to the desk and he said his topic was the bioluminescent squirrel. Hmm. <laughs> Didn't sound quite right to me. I, I couldn't remember seeing any squirrels glowing. <laughs> in the trees. So I immediately kicked into librarian mode and I said, okay, uh, um, where, where did you find this topic? How did you choose it? His answer, found it on the internet, of course. So I asked him to show me the website and he brought me to the web page. And the web page was Actually, this was the name of a garage band, the Bioluminescent Squirrel. Sure. <laughs> it's a great name. It is a good, it is a band good name, name for a band. Hopefully they'll get some hits now that you mentioned them. I know. And as you scrolled through the page, you could really tell quickly this was, was not. <laughs> well, this is hard. Yes, yes. But it was a great opportunity for me as a librarian to teach this young man more to perhaps read more than just the headline, as Jim was saying, read a little further than the headline, and critically think about your sites. We work one-on-one -on -one with our young customers every day here at the public library. 
we should be incorporating digital literacy as much as we can in every reference transaction that we have. This way, children can go, grow older and take those critical thinking skills and evaluate what they see online as they become adults. Although, in this era of fake news, evaluating what you see online is becoming more and more complicated, even for the savviest adults. Some people are starting to get their news while using browser plugins. A browser plugin is just a little program or an extension that can be added into your web browser. For example, Ad Detector is an extension for Chrome and Firefox that spots paid content or sponsored stories on your website. If a paid ad or sponsored story comes up, Ad Detector will turn the top of your window red and it just gives you an alert. This is perhaps not a real news story. This is paid content. The Skokie Public Library created a great PDF guide online that lists five different browser extensions. Amy Kester, the Youth and Family Program Supervisor at Skokie, created this site. And we're going to post this online at gailborden.info slash fake news. So if you want to get these websites and links after we speak today, you can go there and find more information. Overall, it's hard to find a list of all the fake news sites online because the web is an ever-changing and very volatile place. According to the Daily Dot Internet News site, Melissa Zimdars, a media professor at Merrimack College in Massachusetts, did begin to compile a list of fake, false, and regularly misleading websites. Unfortunately, the list was removed due to threats and harassment that Professor Zimdars received. However, if you go to the Daily Dot news website, you can search for fake news, and they compiled the list of 25 fake news sites identified from the professor's guide. Also on the Daily Dot, they give some tips from Professor Zimdars on how to look for fake news. And I wanted to share some of those with you today. The first tip, avoid websites that end in low, L-O. An example of this is the site Newslow. These sites take pieces of accurate information and then package that information with other false or misleading facts, as they call them. Sometimes this is for the sake of satire. If you look at the Newslow site, they claim to be the first hybrid news satire site. But boy, if you go on there, it's really hard to tell which is the news <laughs> and which is the satire. Her second tip, watch out for websites that end in .com, .co. They're often fake versions of real news sites. One that's been going around and is pretty famous is abcnews.com.co. That is not the Channel 7 News that I watch every night. That's a very different website. Number three, if the story makes you really angry, then it's a good idea to keep reading. And the fourth one is my favorite. It's always best to read multiple sources of information to get a variety of viewpoints and media frames. Of course I love this one because I think everyone should read more, read more critically, and read at the library. Other ways to fight fake news, especially fake political news, are to use fact-checking websites. Uh, Katie, you mentioned your favorite LibGuide. Uh, my favorite LibGuide came from the Public Library of Albuquerque, and they list some great fact-checking websites. The first one is PolitiFact. It's P-O-L-I-T-I -I Fact, PolitiFact. That's a Pulitzer Prize-winning fact-checking website. FactCheck.org is another one. 
And of course, Snopes is Snopes, S-N-O-P-E-S. That's one of the longest running debunking websites out there right now. Just as we talk about reviewing your websites, you can also review your fact checkers. These all, all of these pages I mentioned do have the about information so you can find out who your fact checkers exactly are. As a citizenry, we deserve real news and hard facts, allowing us to make up our own minds using accurate information and not being persuaded with lies and half-truths. Libraries and librarians need to be on the front line, advocating for ourselves as information literacy educators, helping sift the real news from the fake news, and provide true and accurate information to our communities because our communities deserve true and accurate information. I encourage everyone, all the librarians, to have a program like this at their library, continue the conversation, and know librarians are the best weapon against fake news. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. And I think we're at the stage where we're going to accept some of the questions in, uh, from the audience either here or online. And Denise Rowley is at a microphone and is ready to start posing some of those questions. Yeah, we got several from online already. And uh, Liz Clemens here is going to pick up any questions from the audience. But I'll go ahead and start with some of our online questions. Uh, again, thank you for this wonderful information from all of you. Uh, we got a question for Jim Davis. Can you comment on the news cycle and how stories evolve over time? How do early versions of the story differ, differ from coverage a day later or a week later? I'll pass that on to Elena. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, I hope I understand the question. Uh, but I, 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 I will say this. Today, it's more important than ever to get something posted quickly. Mm -hmm. We're all our reporters know very well, especially when it's something that's what we consider breaking news, uh, a bad traffic accident, uh, uh, a crime of significance, that sort of thing. There's a ton of competition out there for the very same set of circumstances. And so we encourage our reporters to get maybe as little as two paragraphs up, and then we will post it online, and that's our story right out of the gate. But obviously, we want to fill it in with more information. So in the course of the day, uh, particularly if it's, a, if it's a big breaking story that has a lot of components to it, and boy, it seemed like we started out January with just some amazing stories. You know, we had those uh, four kids accused of taking the uh, uh, student with disabilities into a McDonald's and abusing him. And um, that was something that was we were getting more information as the day wore on. I bet we updated that story five, six, seven, eight times during the course of the day. Uh, and the story got longer. It got more detailed. And really, frankly, the last thing we do in the day is we look at what we've done online, and then we try to make it read well for our, for our print editions and, the, and what we're going to post the next day. Uh, because sometimes when you're hurt, in a hurry, <laughs> you lose a little bit of continuity and flow in your story. Uh, but if you come back to it and polish it a bit, it's going to be a pretty good read. It's going to be awfully compelling. In fact, Ellen is the person who ended up really being almost like our rewrite person on that story. She was in the office. A lot of people were feeding her stuff, but she crafted the story from the, from the data that she was given. Um, there was also a component about the, the next day. I think what will usually happen when we have a big story We'll all convene, convene at the uh, morning meeting and we'll talk about it. What angles are left unpursued? What should we be doing? What will be of interest? Uh, and, and that can be anything and everything. Um, you know, we had a lot of activity this weekend at O'Hare Airport and others with the whole uh, travel ban, immigration policy. Um, and we found out over the weekend that there was a couple from Park Ridge who teach at Oakton Community College who uh, were among the detainees. We thought, well, okay, there's, there's somebody in our circulation footprint who was right in the middle of this thing. So uh, we decided in the morning we'd sure like to talk to them. So 
I went went out and talked to uh, one of our reporters. And said, "Okay, you find these people, and let's do a good story on what their whole experience was like." And she came through. She ended up running over to Oak Oakton and literally captured this man coming out of the the tutoring class that he teaches. But she put together a pretty darn good story that we ran on the front page today. So, so I guess that's how a story might evolve. And 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 this is something that may national news may have some local angle, I'm guessing, for quite some time to come if this administration continues to go in the direction that it's been going. Thank you, Jim. I have a question here for Veranda. Can you discuss the difference between fake news and articles that may be technically accurate but so slanted that they do not contribute to a productive dialogue? Well, I think that's a subjective uh, question in that, if I understand it correctly, if an article has is so slanted that it doesn't contribute to a productive dialogue potential, how do, what's the difference between the two? Well, I think that's where critical thinking is vital. Uh, one person's uh, slanted article is another person's gold. And to integrate that source with others that are uh, what you personally may consider more unbiased is how we balance all of our thinking in terms of understanding all sides of an issue and presenting an informed uh, representation of our thoughts, which, or beliefs on something, which can, you know shift as we uh, learn more about it. Uh, this is a question from our audience here. Uh, and this is probably Margaret, and I think Katie could probably answer this, because this might, it's a great question from whoever asked it, but uh, it might be, might be a joint effort between the two organizations. Has any thought been given to a, a Yale Borden Library and maybe a U46 providing a website to check facts, especially for checking on stories about state and local politics. Mm. What a great idea. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap. <laughs> We're done here. <laughs> that is a great idea. Yeah. We don't have anything like that yet, but it's something that I could add to my library catalog or something that if I know that, um, what was it, NPR, who was doing the fact checking during the political debates. Um, so that would be something that I would add to my library catalog that the students could use if they needed to. But I um, I would need a lot of other resources to be able to make sure that that was a, in, a reliable source for them to go to. Uh, this is another one from our in-person audience. Do you feel that there is a responsibility from news and information publishers to remove or moderate comments on their pages that are That's clearly fake? people that skew the narrative in the same way that fake news does? That's a really good question. That might be for me, huh? Yeah. I, I think know, that is. I think that's Jim. Go ahead. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> online commenting is no small challenge. Um, and I think the biggest step that we took to eliminate as much of the anonymity to it as we could was when we make people go in through Facebook. Um, yeah, you can use theoretically a made-up name, or, or you might have a somewhat... I have a nephew who goes just by his first and middle name online mm -hmm. because of some of the stuff that I think he's put on there. Um, but there is some measure of accountability when you do it that way. Uh, used to be anybody with any kind of a internet access could just go on and, and comment as anybody and finding out exactly who they were was nigh on impossible. So, but that said, people still do say pretty mean and hurtful things mm -hmm. online and go out after ever other commenters, go out after the sources and the stories, go after the newspaper, you know, anybody can get hit from any direction. So we do monitor those comments. We try to stay on top of them. Um, if somebody says something that, that, frankly, we deem truly offensive, we'll remove it. And if there's somebody who's engaged in a 
repeat pattern of doing that will suspend their commenting privileges. And, I, and that like has happened. To too. Could I add to that too? You know, uh, as we talk as, li about, as librarians about digital literacy, I think it's important for us to also exercise and support digital etiquette. And I'm speaking from my personal opinion here, my personal experience. I am a huge Project Runway fan. This relates. <laughs> and my friends and I um, talk on Twitter about it during the show. And it uh, finally occurred to me, you know, obviously the people who are on the show, the designers, are on Twitter too. And I finally made a commitment to myself. I'm not going to say any about thing about them online that I wouldn't say to them in their face. And to treat, you take the what I hope is the etiquette and compassion I was raised with personally, to interact with people personally, to start to use that more actively in an online space. And I'm not saying I was like going after these designers in any kind of way, but I would be snarky. I'm funny. Hey. <laughs> but but uh, I really wanted to, ch I started to change my tone and say, no, I'm not going to tag them and be like, I could have made that. I'm a brilliant. Uh, and really, um, maybe to start to make that part of our personal commitment to how we live online, but also as we work with whomever we serve to support them in doing that as well. That's a really good lesson for everybody, I think. Not just in the news media, but anybody who has a computer mm -hmm. or a phone or a tablet. <laughs> or a brain, <laughs> or half a brain. Anything that you say online, just imagine that anybody on this planet could or will see it, mm -hmm. because that's possible. Likely? Eh, maybe not, but it's possible. So if it's not something that you want everybody that you conceivably think of to see it, don't say it. We want people to be... You know, in with a certain perspective, we want to make sure mm -hmm. that they have access to that, but they also have access to alternative perspectives also. And I think viewing, reading, as I think we've already used the word critical, but I think the ability to kind of judge these things is, is important in that discussion. Um, the other thing that I would say, um, just another, again, kind of personal opinion, is that I think what we're all encouraging everyone to do is be maybe a little bit more thoughtful. Um, I know in the news media they want to have an instantaneous response. I know that as an individual when we're seeing a post or whatever we want to share it or we want to react to it very quickly. And I think what we're all trying to do is encourage people maybe to be a little bit more thoughtful in addition to the etiquette. But just slow down and try to figure out, look at it, and try to figure out if it is correct, think about before you actually do share it. This is a beginning of a discussion that we're having on this topic of, of fake news, a beginning discussion about how we want to behave in a civil society, a beginning discussion about how we think we can uh, engage in open discussion that is civil and can occur in a library. What we want with this program, as uh, Margaret has already said, is that we don't want this program to end just here today at noon at, Ga at Gail Borden Public Library District in Elgin. This is a discussion that should be occurring in a variety of libraries across the state of Illinois and really across libraries across the United States. Um, one of the things that I shared uh, with uh, Denise Riley here at the Gail Borden Public Library is that there is another organization that is called IFLA. It's the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions. They have done a very nice graphic on the topic about how you should respond to fake news, how to judge it. This information is going to be available along with all the other suggestions at the gailborden.info website. So we encourage everybody to go there. 
But the one reason why I mentioned the IFWA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, because this is a discussion much broader than Illinois. It's a much broader discussion than the United States. And we see that the library community throughout the world is trying to tackle this problem, trying to pre to give uh, advice and suggestions about how to address fake news. So it's not just an issue within, within the United States. And on that editorial comment, I guess, I'll uh, thank everyone for joining us here in Elgin and online. And uh, we're concluded. Thank you. You can stand up. Oh, can we? I don't know. Like, do I stay here forever? <laughs> <laughs>